Well, let's start off this morning as we uh, open our worship time together. I want to share this scripture with you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Come on up, Dave. It says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Lord says, Come, come to me. His arms are wide open to us. He welcomes us to come. And notice, it's not the throne of a tyrant. It's called the throne of what? Grace. It's a, great, it's a throne of grace and mercy. He invites us to come and worship before him. And so we're going to do that this morning. Let me invite you. Let's stand together as Dave comes and leads us in our opening hymn. Dave? Footsteps of Jesus. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come follow me. And we see where thy footsteps falling lead us to. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Though they lead o'er the cold, dark mountain seeking his sheep, or Sing, there's something about that name. We'll sing it twice through. Yes. 
Good morning. Um, welcome. We would like to take a time to maybe welcome anyone who is here for the very first time at Legacy Service. Um, is anyone here for the first time? Doesn't look like it. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad that you're all with us. Um, to start out, I would like to remind us all that tonight in the garden room, um, Pastor Gary will be with you all at 6.30 p.m., so please um, come back later tonight in the garden room over in the manor and enjoy a um, continuation. I believe last week you said you were in Mark 10, am I right? Are you continuing that? So you'll be continuing uh, a continuation of Mark 10. Um, so join Gary tonight in the garden room at 6.30 p.m. Um, and then as well, uh, we just want to give a huge thanks to you all for supporting Laundry Love. I forget the basket every time. Um, so the basket will be out for you all um, if you would like to put your loose change in. Um, Carlos and Wendy are going to be going out on the 19th of March, so be praying um, that those laundry mats are really busy. Um, we want lots of people to be coming um, to, uh, so that we can provide for them and then as well so that we can minister to them and um, hopefully, uh, you know, allow some people to meet Jesus for the first time or maybe rekindle their relationship with Jesus that day. Um, so be praying for March uh, 19th, um, Laundry Love. Um, and then as well, we have a fun announcement. Today, there will be a lunch at Olive Garden just across the street. So if you would like to join, I believe, Pastor Gary and um, Joy uh, for a little lunch together, um, please uh, make yourself uh, available to go over to um, the Olive Garden for a, a little lunch um, or maybe a big lunch. <laughs> it might be a big lunch. So um, yes, join Pastor Gary and um, joy at Olive Garden. Um, and then, of course, we have our prayer requests, and um, we are, yes, you want to do the prayer request? Yes. Well, you all got quiet real quick there. My goodness. Well, next week, we are going to have our guests back with us again. The Calvary Choir is going to be here again next Sunday. So we look forward to that. They always do a wonderful job, and, and we're so appreciative that the choir is able to come and hopefully about once a month come and join us here at Celebration. So we're looking forward to having them with us here next week. So we uh, will plan on that. Well, let me invite you. Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Genesis as we continue this series we started a couple of weeks ago where we're looking at the life of Jacob in the book of Genesis. Now, you talk about a, a messed up, dysfunctional, codependent family. Boy, you know, if they'd had reality TV back in the Bible days, this would have been a show you wouldn't miss. You'd want to watch this show every single week. Boy, the story of Jacob and his family, I'm convinced it would have been a weekly hit. I think people, people would have tuned in to the Jacobson show to find out what's going on next in this crazy family. And in Genesis 27, the story of this soap opera gets even more interesting. As, this, as the family members try to outmaneuver and outmanipulate one another in order to gain the family fortune. Now, you and I know that whenever money becomes involved, sometimes it has a way of bringing out the absolute worst in people's lives, doesn't it? And boy, do we ever see that happening right here in Genesis 27. Now, to set the scene for you, let's go back and kind of review where we are and what brought us to this chapter. So you'll remember that uh, in Genesis 26, we have the story of the birth of these two boys. Jacob and Esau are born to Isaac and Rebekah. And remember, while Rebekah was pregnant, 
God spoke to her and said something very interesting and very unusual. The Lord said, remember this, the elder, the older, shall serve the younger. Very unusual. Who was the older son? Esau was the older son. Jacob was the younger son. So God said, I've ordained that the Abrahamic covenant is going to go not through Esau's line, it's going to go through Jacob's line. That's what God had ordained. Well, the boys grow up. And remember, the parents kind of had their favorites, didn't they? Do you remember who, who, was, who was Rebecca's favorite? Who was that? Rebecca's favorite. Jacob. Jacob. Isaac's favorite was Esau because he loved what he could hunt and cook up for him. Remember that? So now the boys are grown, and Isaac has gotten it in his mind that he is going to circumvent the will of God. And he's going to make sure that his oldest son Esau gets the family blessing and the family inheritance. Well, Rebecca is not just going to sit around and, and let this happen to her favorite son, Jacob. So she overhears some of this plan, and she decides that she's going to put together her own plan to make sure that the family inheritance and blessing all goes to her son, Jacob. Well, the scene is set here for this incredible power struggle that's going to go on. And this story for us today illustrates the danger of what can happen when we tamper and mess with the will of God. So on the one hand, Esau is going to be, according to his dad, he's going to be the one that's going to get the family blessing. And on the other hand, Rebecca, his wife, Isaac's wife, she's working over here, and she's going to guarantee that Jacob gets the family blessing. Well, one thing we need to remember, God doesn't need our help, does he? When it comes to accomplishing his plan, we need to leave things with the Lord. But instead of letting God handle things, Rebecca thought she had to jump in there and take control. Remember somebody else in the, in the Bible who tried to do that? It was Moses. Remember, God said, I'm going, to deliver, I'm going to deliver my people. I'm going to use you, Moses. But you remember what he did? He killed an Egyptian. And what happened to God's plan? Did, Moses tried to speed things up, but he only slowed things down. In fact, did you remember what happened? After that Egyptian was killed, it took another 40 years for God's plan to be fulfilled to deliver his people. When we try to speed things up, we end up only slowing things down. Well, now because Isaac's eyesight is not very good, Rebecca's plan was to disguise Jacob to make her husband think that it's Esau that he's going to bless. And so we're going to pick up the story now with Jacob's deception here in Genesis 27. And let's, let's start here in verse 18. Genesis 27, 18. Then he came to his father and said, My father! And he said, Here I am! Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Get up, please, and sit and eat of my game, that you may bless me. Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God caused it to happen to me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come close that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. You kind of get the idea there's a little doubt going on. Something just doesn't quite seem right here to Isaac, does it? Verse 22. So Jacob came close to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Remember, Esau's hands were very hairy. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. 
So he blessed him. And he said, Are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. So he said, Bring it to me, and I will eat of my son's game, that I may bless you. And he brought it to him, and he ate. And he also brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Please come close and kiss me, my son. So he came close and kissed him. And when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him. And notice what he said. Notice the blessing. See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Now may God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master to your brothers and may your brothers, your mother's sons also bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. So, uh, here is Isaac. He's all ready to bless what he thinks is going to be Esau, but it's Jacob in disguise. And boy, have they pulled this off. Remember what happened? His mother, Rebecca, she put this furry-like kind of material on him to kind of simulate the, the hairiness of his brother Esau. And, and with his eyesight failing, Isaac thinks he's blessing his oldest son, Esau. But Jake's Jacob in disguise. So dressed up like Esau, he tricks his father into believing he's actually his son, Esau. Now, as so often happens in situations like this. One step leads to another step, which leads to another step of deception. And in the end, Jacob is guilty, isn't he, of multiple lies and deceptions. Now, I want you to notice what Jacob's sin was. Jacob's sin was attempting to secure God's blessing in a deceitful way. If you'd write that down. Jacob's sin, what was it? It was attempting to get God's blessing, but to do so in a deceitful, underhanded way. He was trying to manipulate the situation, wasn't he? To get what he wanted. He wanted to take things into his own hands. Now let me ask you, have you ever felt like doing that? Have you ever felt like maybe you, you, you sensed that God was going to come through, but he was just taking too long, and maybe you needed to help him out? And so you jumped into the situation, thinking that if only you could take care of this or, or manipulate that, that you could help God out. Well, I want you to just realize how deceptive Jacob has really been here. We said that he was guilty of multiple lies, but let's go back and just look at this once again real quick. I want you to see how many times do you think Jacob actually deceived his father Isaac? Let's take a look at it. First of all, look at verse 18. Lie number one, he poses as Esau. His father says, is that you? And in verse 19 he says, yep, it's me. Your firstborn son, I'm here. Lie number one. Okay, there's another one. Lie number two. The end of verse 19. Jacob claims, I am Esau. All right, there's a third lie. He lies about fulfilling his dad's request. Remember, his dad said, fix me up that, that, that favorite dish you make that I love. And all of a sudden, Jacob comes back with this dish, posed as Esau, but he didn't prepare the dish. Who fixed it? His mom back in the kitchen, Rebecca, she put that all together. But he comes out in verse, end of verse 19, and he says, I have done as you requested. He lies a third time. All right, now we're not done yet. Lie number four. He lies about where the food came from in verse 20. Where it came from. He says, the Lord provided. Well, that's ridiculous. The Lord didn't provide. That was your mom who did that. Rebecca fixed the meal. All right, lie number five. We're not done yet. He pretended to be Esau all the way through, notice, 
verses 21, 22, and 23 by having those skins, that furry material on his arms. All of that was another, again, further deception. And then finally, lie number six. He claims to be Esau a second time in verse 24. Are you my son? Yes, sir. I am. That's me. Six specific times he's trying to deceive his father. You say, why did he do all that? Because Jacob was convinced that the end justifies the means. And you know, sometimes we've done things, maybe not as blatant as Jacob here, but sometimes on our own, out of fear, maybe we have tended to want to try to run ahead of God or try to do things for God instead of waiting on Him. And sometimes we can even rationalize that, that by our actions, we're helping God out. We're helping God's plan to be accomplished. But you know something? God never operates in deceitful ways, does he? Does he? Never. In fact, write this down. If you have to do something dishonest to fulfill your plan, you can be sure it's not God's way. If you have to do, if you have to sneak around, if you have to use deceit or trickery, you can be sure that that is not God's plan. God doesn't operate like that. He will never con condone anything that is underhanded or deceitful in any way whatsoever because it ru runs contrary to all that God is. It runs contrary to the very person of God himself. God can have no part of evil whatsoever. So if our plan involves deceit or deception of any kind, we can be certain, uh-uh, that's not God's way. In fact, mark this down. It is never right to do wrong in order to do right. Let me say that again. It is never right to do wrong in order to accomplish something good. God cannot and will not bless lies or deceitful scheming. Now, we may convince ourselves. We may be convinced that, well, this is justified or I need to do such and such. But if we have to use deception, we can be certain that is not God's way. Now, it sometimes may even look at the, initially at the, at the outset that things seem to be working out. It might appear that way at the beginning. But as we're going to see in the life of Jacob in the weeks to come, this decision right here is going to have incredible, incredible results. And it's going to alter and change the life of Jacob for the rest of his years. Now you say, why was securing this blessing, why would something like this, just this prayer that his dad says over him, why would that be so important, so significant, that Jacob would go to such uh, an end to try to deceive his father and receive the blessing ahead uh, instead of his older brother? Well, look at it again. In verses 28 and 29, this prayer of blessing has four features that accompany it. Notice what they are. First of all, if you look at verse 29, as Isaac is praying over Jacob, the first thing he's praying is that he will have political power and authority over nations. Then he goes on, and he also prays that he will have agricultural prosperity. In verse 28, he says, May the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and the abundance of grain and wine be yours. He's praying that, that everything he puts his hand to in the area of farming and agriculture will be blessed beyond normal means. And then, thirdly, he says, And may you have... Uh, preference over your brothers. You're going to rule over your brothers and over his family line. Remember how unusual that is because it's always the older that receives the blessing and is the one in charge. But in this case, God says it's reversed through this blessing of Isaac. 
And then finally, he assures him of God's divine protection in verse 29, that whoever curses you and your family, Jacob, will also be cursed. But what do you think is going to happen when Isaac realizes he's been outsmarted? Well, let's look at Isaac's discovery now in verses 30 to 33. How do you think he's going to respond when the truth comes out to all of this? Look at verse 30. Now it came about as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. Then he also made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that you may bless me. Isaac, his father, said to him, Who are you? And he said, Why, I'm your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac, watch this, Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was he then that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate of it all before you came and I blessed him? Yes, and notice this, and he, referring to Jacob, he shall be blessed. Now notice what's going on here. No sooner had Jacob left than Esau appears to receive his father's blessing. And as soon as he hears Esau's voice, he knew something was wrong. He knew things weren't right. And he immediately realized that his scheme to bless his older son instead of his younger son had all gone awry. In fact, notice there is a physical reaction here as well as an emotional reaction. Look again at verse 33. It says he shook how? Violently. Now, literally in the Hebrew, it means he trembled excessively with great trembling, if we were to translate that literally, word for word. In other words, he was, his body was shaking. It was almost like he was convulsing from head to toe, shaking from top to bottom. And it wasn't just merely out of anger at being deceived. It's much greater than that, I believe. I believe he knew that his plan and what he tried to do by attempting to bless his older son was a grave sin against God. And he realized that God had suddenly intervened. And I think he was feeling the guilt and the hand of God's conviction on his life. In fact, I think we see it in verse 33. I think he realizes God has had his way in the end. His will has prevailed, not mine. And so he says at the end of verse 33, yes, and he, Jacob, is the one that shall be blessed. In other words, God has overruled my plan and caused his will to prevail in spite of my plan. God's will had indeed triumphed over human will, hadn't it? But I want you to notice the most important thing about all of this. I want you to see the sovereignty of God in action in this story. Watch this. It's on your outline. Do you realize what's going on here? Let me say it this way. This is fabulous. God mocked evil in this story by permitting the evil of Satan in Isaac to be defeated by the evil of Satan in Jacob. Now just think about that a minute. Let that sink in. God used the lies of Jacob to overcome the deception of Isaac. In other words, the trickery of Isaac, the father, was undone by the deceit of Jacob. God is able to take the evil of Satan and turn it on its head. That's exactly what we see in this story. You see, we may be able to deceive other people, but no one deceives God. 
Now think about this. I know some of you are still writing. I want to give you another thought that will drive home the point that I believe this story is illustrating for us. There's something else I want you to see here, and it's very, very important. This is such a, a dynamic illustration of the sovereignty of God, how a person may make a plan, but God is going to win in the end because he is sovereign. So here's another point. Are you ready? Let me give you this. Don't miss this right here. Think about it this way. God so controlled matters that he caused the enemy to actually defeat himself. God so controlled the circumstances in this story that the enemy worked against himself and actually defeated himself. That's what we see happening in this story. You know something? Only God could do that. Only God is able to accomplish something like that. He takes the work of the enemy and turns it around. So what? It accomplishes his plan and his will. What God is able to do is absolutely amazing, isn't it? The sovereignty of God. And Isaac himself admits as much. He realizes he's been had. He's been outdone by God. You see, in the end, God will have the last say. Now, would you notice with me verses 34 through 37. Notice what Isaac must now acknowledge. He says in verse 34, When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac replied to Esau, Behold, I have made him your master. And all his relatives I have given to him as servants. And with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now as for you then, what can I do, my son? Well, as you can see, this is a sad scenario. It's a sad scene. Esau comes in and he sees his father shaking. And he stands there with that plate of venison in his hand that he was going to serve to his father Isaac. And he is stunned by what he sees. And it says Esau cries out, literally here, in agony and desperation before his father. The word cry there is really more like a scream. It's a wail, if you will, of disappointment. Esau, when he realizes what has happened, this man is devastated and heartbroken. But no matter what he says, he cannot change what's happened. His father's prayer of blessing. It was too late. What had been done was done. Now, please understand something here. We need to realize that for years, Esau had shown no interest in the things of God whatsoever. He was unwilling to ever change his lifestyle. He married two pagan Hittite women in, in direct defiance of his parents. God was not his first priority. And now he cries out. And he carries on when he does not receive the blessing of God. You know, there are a lot of people, I'm convinced, that do the same sort of thing as Esau was doing here today. In fact, uh, it was in Where Was God that Erwin Lutzer wrote these words. Listen to this. People disregard God in good times yet think he is obligated to provide help when bad times come. They believe the God they dishonor when they are well 
should heal them when they are now sick. The God they ignore when they are wealthy should rescue them from impending poverty. And the God they refuse to worship when the earth is still should somehow now rescue them when it begins to shake. End of quote. Isn't that interesting? Well, that's Esau. And I want you to realize today that that there's an important principle. Here's the point. To receive the blessing of God, you must be the kind of person God blesses. You must be the kind of person God can bless. If you want to receive God's blessing, then you've got to be in line with the things, the kind of person that he wants to bless. And those are a person, those are people who align themselves with his ways. They take God seriously. They take seriously what God says is serious. They follow him, not perfectly, but could I say wholeheartedly. Listen to Deuteronomy 13, 4. I think it describes the kind of person God wants to bless. Deuteronomy 13, 4 says this. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. You shall keep his commandments. Listen to his voice. Serve him and cling to him. Now, what we need to realize is the kind of person God blesses still stumbles. They're not perfect, but they do seek him with all their heart and desire to please him. I would ask you this morning the question, are you the kind of person God can bless? If you want God's blessing in your life, then you've got to be the kind of person God can bless. Well, you'll notice in the story here that in desperation, Esau pleads, begs his father. He said, certainly, Father, you must have some blessing left over for me. Well, he does receive a blessing from his father, but could I add that it almost sounds by comparison with the blessing Jacob received almost like a curse. In fact, there are three features in the blessing that Esau receives, and none of the three are anything you or I would ever want. Would you look with me at verses 39 and 40? Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve. But it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. Three things make up this second blessing, which again, I put that in italics. Is it really that much of a blessing? Well, three features stand out. The soil, the sword, and servitude. You say, what do you mean? Well, the soil that that his ancestors were going to inherit was going to be a dry, desolate place. In other words, they were going to be living in a harsh wilderness, a desert-like land. And they became the people of Edom. They're called in the Bible the Edomites. That was Esau's descendants, the Edomites. Second, we see that the sword is going to be prominent. They're going to have to live by the sword, and they will also die by the sword. There will be vengeance against them and their family. And then finally, servitude. Notice it says that you will serve your brother's people. Well, all three of those predictions all came to pass. They lived in a barren land. The Edomites lived as servants of the Israelites. And the sword finally itself fell against Edom. 
When Saul fought against the Edomites in 1 Samuel 14, David later came along, and the Bible says he slew 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. And that his commander Joab stayed in the conquered land another six months until he slew every male in the region. They were all wiped out. Well, the story wraps up with Esau's response. We need to see this. Verse 41. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. You talk about sibling rivalry, huh? This is about to get out of hand. Now when the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she sent and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. Flee to Haran, to my brother Laban. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides, until your brother's anger against you subsides, and he forgets what you did to him. Then I will send and get you from there. Why should I be bereaved of you both in one day? Well, in response... To what has just happened, Esau vows to kill his brother. And as the curtain goes down on act one of the Jacobsons, what do we learn from this sordid scene? One lesson remains clear, and here it is. You can never trick or outmaneuver God. You can never think that you'll be in a position to ever outsmart God. If you think you can outsmart the Lord, think again. You think playing chess against a computer is hard, try taking on God and see what happens. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9 says, The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Now, what is Proverbs telling us there? Simply that the Lord will have the last say. He'll have the final word. In fact, the word directs there in Proverbs 16, 9 literally means to determine or set in place or firmly decide. The mind of a person makes his plans, but the Lord has the final say. Somebody once said this. I've never forgot. Somebody once said, you want to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. You think you're in charge? Think again. God will always have the last say. He will never be outdone or manipulated or fooled by anyone. He can't be tricked and he can't be deceived. Why? Because God knows all. God sees all. And God controls all. And when you think you can try and tamper with the will of God, you're taking on a battle you could never hope to win. What a story. What a demonstration of the absolute sovereignty of God. Well, we're going to see this story continue And may I suggest, it's going to get a lot worse for Jacob, isn't it, before it gets any better. Jacob, you didn't like things at home with with your mom, Isaac, and and Rebecca. Just try Laban for a while. Oh, my. Life's going to get a lot more difficult, isn't it? Because he's not doing things God's way. If you want God to bless you, you got to be a person God can bless. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. Again, for your word. The scriptures are so often like a mirror. And as we read these stories, and as we look at the life of Jacob, we see ourselves. 
We can see ourselves right there in the shoes of, of Jacob and Rebekah. And how many times have we tried to, to manipulate things our way? How many times have we tried to run on ahead because it just felt like you were taking too long and we couldn't trust your promises? We couldn't wait on the Lord. Father, what a tremendous illustration this is of how important it is not to take things into our own hands but to leave things in your hands. Father, help us to learn from this story the importance of waiting on the Lord trusting him, taking our hands off of the situation. Pray, yes, we should. But to get in and to manipulate and to try to make things happen on our own, we just make things all that much worse. So, Lord, thank you for this powerful story and the lessons we're going to learn in the weeks to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.